Funding for NJ Spotlight News provided by NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of residents and businesses for more than 100 years. PSENG, we make things work for communities. And Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. This is NJ Spotlight News with Brianna Venosi. Good evening and thanks for joining us on NJ Spotlight News this Veterans Day. Well, state leaders are warning the next few months will need to be closely watched as we again hit record high levels of new daily coronavirus cases. More than 3,000 new positive tests being reported today by the health department. The administration says we should expect to see the daily total hover around that mark for some time to come. The cumulative number is now more than 263,000 statewide with 15 additional deaths and roughly 16,500 total fatalities since the start of this pandemic. To help limit spread, the governor is asking residents to avoid any non-essential travel. This map shows now nearly the entire country, just about every state, is on New Jersey's coronavirus quarantine travel advisory list. Maine and New Hampshire have been added, expanding the list to 45 states and territories from which Governor Murphy is asking travelers to self-quarantine for two weeks. Pennsylvania, Delaware and Connecticut, those meet the criteria for the travel ban but haven't been included on the map. Murphy says they're just too closely connected to the state to make a ban reasonable. The grip of the virus is clamping down even as we look to honor those who've helped in our battles of the past, our veterans, also one of the hardest hit communities. This day is typically marked by parade ceremonies, military bands. But as senior correspondent Brenda Flanagan reports, this year it's being commemorated amid the strain of rising infections. Liberty, justice for all. Veterans Day ceremonies honor thousands of New Jerseyans who served in war and peace, but only a memorial near the Menlo Park Veterans Home today focused on the more than 190 vets who died of COVID-19 at Jersey's state-run veterans' homes during a spring pandemic response marked by alleged chaos, terror, and mismanagement. For VFW Vice Commander Jay Boxwell, it still hurts. So many veterans uh, lost their lives um, because of uh, lack of, of planning, uh, lack of oversight and administration. It's very painful. Um, I just left an event right now and uh, you know, there were tears in folks' eyes as we were talking about uh, the veterans that passed away in these facilities. Last month, the federal government assigned infection control specialists to help the vets' homes comply with safety standards. Right now, Menlo Park's got two residents hospitalized with COVID, while the Paramus facility isolated residents in their rooms after one recently tested positive with four test results still pending. The Vineland Vets Home also reported a COVID hospitalization and one positive test. Positive cases mean families can't visit for two weeks. They still haven't been able to uh, have access to their family members in, in the veterans' homes. Um, there's a lot of frustration with that. Um, there's still staffing shortages. They haven't hired, you know, ample staff to, to cover different shifts. Both the Menlo Park and Paramus Vets Homes also remain under investigation by Jersey's Attorney General. In mid-October, Governor Murphy finally removed the CEOs at both facilities and accepted Department of Veterans and Military Affairs leader Jamal Beal's resignation. Congressman Bill Pascrell, who had called for their ouster, today said that's not enough. Here we have a second wave coming through on the virus itself. We need to have people who are there that can do the job. And just to change people, I mean, we're not having the, you know, the musical chairs game. We want people to be in these positions that are prepared for pandemics and epidemics. Murphy's appointed interim replacements at the vet's homes and assigned Colonel Lisa Howe, a physician, to temporarily head the DVMA. At virtual Veterans Day ceremonies today, neither Murphy nor Howe mentioned veterans' lives lost to the COVID crisis. Unfortunately, we are observing yet another patriotic holiday under COVID-19 protocols. As veterans, we are familiar with the mantra of improvise, adapt, and overcome.
but another federal investigation is underway. In an October 27th letter, the U.S. Department of Justice noted its concern that the quality of medical care at these homes has been deficient, violating the vet's constitutional rights. The Murphy administration noted the timing a week before Election Day speaks volumes about the nature of the review, adding, New Jersey's relied on CDC guidance from the federal government to protect the residents of our veterans' homes. But Boxwell thinks it could spur reforms, even a consent decree. And that's really going to force, you know, change in these facilities based on staffing needs, um, you know, quality of care, quality of life all those things. They're, it's going to check off every box that we've had issues with. Meanwhile, many grieving vets' families have filed individual lawsuits demanding accountability for the way their loved ones died. I'm Brenda Flanagan, NJ Spotlight News. The rapid surge of new cases has a lot of people wondering about the holidays, how we can safely gather or whether we should at all. The CDC is out with a new robust set of guidelines to follow for Thanksgiving. In normal times, large groups of friends and family travel from far locations to get together. But this year, to keep the virus at bay, the holiday will need to be a bit different. Perry Halkidis is dean of the Rutgers School of Public Health, and he's here to break it down for us. Dr. Halkidis, thank you, first of all, for taking a couple of minutes. I think the question on everyone's mind right now is, do we have to cancel Thanksgiving with our families? So that is an extreme. I think we have to be thoughtful about how we do Thanksgiving with our families. The CDC recently issued guidance on how to do this more safely. And it's not about yes or no. It is about how we reduce the harm. So if I were going to see my family on Thanksgiving day, I would do a rapid test to assure myself that it, like the Thursday before, that I am not exposed to um, the virus. I would also at the same time do the PCR test, wait for the results, physically distance from everything, don't put myself in harm's way, and then either get to where I'm going uh, in, a, in a way that doesn't expose me or have my family come to me and do the same things that I've just described without being exposed to the virus along the way also. It's a lot to ask of people, but that's one crucial step. The other thing is that when we're together, this is probably even you know as important as the testing and assuring that we're not exposed to the virus is physically distancing with each other. If we're inside, keeping our masks on, you know, potentially doing individual portions of food, not everybody, not doing family style, which we know is you know, the tradition yeah. of Thanksgiving. Anything that will lessen the spread of the germs is another thing that we can do with each other. And I would say the last thing is this, probably not a, the best idea for a 50 family member Thanksgiving this year. Why don't we just agree that we should keep it to like, you know, four, five, six, maybe 10 max in order to contain the virus. But how do you convince people to actually carry this out, Dr. Halkidis, and to buy into this? So one of the things that I've spent much of the last six months thinking about and praying for and hoping for is more altruism among, the, among American people which is altru altruism, which is our sense of self, our sense of community, our sense for those that we love. But what I keep front and center in my mind at all times, and I've written about this, is my brother has MS. And I think about him and what I can do to ensure that if I do see him, I don't infect him and that he continues to live for many, many, many years. But so keep someone in your mind, someone yeah. you love. Someone so in, in your mind, yeah, someone in your mind and someone in your heart who you really love, who is very vulnerable to this, the, the negative effects of this disease and let that be your motivator. Let me just ask you about these restrictions that the governor's office put out with regard to um, closing times for our restaurants and bars um, and, and indoor seating in there. Do you have any concern heading into the holidays that this may do the opposite of what's intended and, and push people into uh, household gatherings rather than in a place where, as we've discussed before, you know, are a bit more regulated? While I totally support the governor's belief that we should not be sitting at bars and drinking or being in large groups, the fact of the matter is that human beings seek pleasure and human beings seek social contact with each other. And as a result of that, we'll likely find ways to get around this. I just ask all of us to just take a breath just for a few more months, not forever, and let's protect each other and we will get through this. And we're asking for just a small, small sacrifice for a little while longer. 
Dr. Perry Halkidis, thank you as always. My pleasure. The story we first brought you last week about the rapid spread of COVID-19 inside the Fort Dix Correctional Facility has state and federal lawmakers stepping in, calling on the Federal Bureau of Prisons to stop inmate transfers until a better testing strategy is in place and there are no longer active cases. Fort Dix has the second highest number of positive coronavirus infections out of any federal prison in the country. Family and friends of the incarcerated say the outbreak was preventable. Michael Hill reports. A third test was done and I came up positive. 60-year-old Luis Rodriguez blames his COVID-19 infection on the federal government, pointing fingers at the Bureau of Prisons, for transferring inmates last month from the Elton, Ohio facility, which had a massive outbreak, to Fort Dix Federal Prison, which in early October reported no virus infections. Within a couple of days of them inmates being in this unit, they basically infected the whole unit, which was negligent on the administration's part to be accepting inmates from other institutions or self-surrender in a pandemic. Rodriguez's fiance Nancy Figueroa recorded the call an hour before she told us Rodriguez has high blood pressure, high cholesterol, asthma, and needs a screening for testicular cancer. I'm very concerned for his life, honestly. And they said um, that he has to cope with it. That's exactly their words. They're doing absolutely nothing to help us get better. Yes, they come around and do it. They do a temperature check. They started doing vials check our blood pressure, our oxygen. But in reality, they're not doing anything for us. They're not giving us no vitamins. They're not giving us no ability to be better or get better. How are we going to get better at this? If I live in a room with 11 inmates in that room, and we're only three feet away from each other, in 2008, Rodriguez began serving a 234-month sentence for felon in possession of a firearm. His application recently for compassionate release home confinement has been denied, along with countless other Fort Dix and federal inmates across the country. The Bureau of Prisons has not responded to our request for release statistics and other information. What the government is telling the public about things being under control is diametrically opposite to what I'm hearing from people on the inside. Matthew Adams says he's had some success winning inmate release. Right here in New Jersey, we have a grave crisis at the Fort Dix facility. So then why aren't more of these inmates being granted compassionate release and home confinement when you hear about their conditions, high cholesterol, asthmatic, and other things that are considered comorbidities? Well. I would say that there is a backlog in the federal courts because there is such a volume of these applications at the moment. Since our report last week, in a letter, New Jersey's Democratic congressional delegation accused the BOP of needlessly endangering frontline employees and their families with inadequate testing, urged the BOP to extend the moratorium on transfers until the BOP eradicates the new COVID-19 outbreak and beyond November 23rd and to the federal prison in Fairton, Cumberland County, and they urged the BOP to institute an effective and accurate testing strategy. According to the Bureau of Prisons website, Fort Dix, with 229 reported inmate infections as of Tuesday, has the worst COVID outbreak among all federal prisons. Michael Hill, NJ Spotlight News. The spread of COVID-19 still taking a hit on the state's Motor Vehicle Commission. As of today, eight of the agency's locations are temporarily closed due to a staff member testing positive for the coronavirus. Bayonne, Cherry Hill and Eatontown are the latest casualties, while five other sites remain closed from earlier detected infections among an employee. Those are slated to reopen within the next week, but keep in mind today, none of the MVC agencies had open hours. The commission is closed to observe Veterans Day. And you can find all the daily COVID-19 numbers, latest reporting, breaking news, and resources about the coronavirus on a special section of our website. Head to njspotlightnews.org and click on the Coronavirus tab. 
Election day may be behind us. It's been just over a week now, but the county board workers are still at it, finishing their counts of mail-in ballots and turning their attention to those paper provisional votes cast in person at the open polling locations. We don't yet know how many of those ballots are left, but we do know the state saw record voter participation this year, almost 4.4 million mail-in ballots cast. And even after each and every one is counted, the job, it's far from done. Our editor-at-large, Colleen O'Day, is on the ballot trail. She joins us now. Colleen, the county boards of election could count ballots that were received up until yesterday. That's November 10th. So where are they at right now in the process? So as far as we know, most of the counties are pretty well done with counting mail-in ballots. There are a couple of uh, exceptions that we know about. Uh, Morris County, which is having a difficult time for a number of reasons, and Union County is also a bit behind. They're still counting mail-in ballots. Um, once all of those are counted in, in any county, now they can start to count the provisional ballots, the ones that people voted when they went in person on election day and you know had to fill out a paper ballot. And even after those are counted, it's still not done, correct? I mean, they still have to review to make sure that these ballots are valid. Yes. So, you know, we're, we're still kind of um, maybe in the middle of the process, I guess, because uh, we also still have this, uh, the question of curing a ballot problem that is ongoing. So anyone who submitted that mail-in ballot and there was a question about a signature or perhaps they didn't sign it, um, that is a process that people can fix. Um, hopefully those letters have gone out, they were to have gone out within 24 hours of uh, a question arising with your ballot. Um, so that process is also still ongoing and that will be ongoing through November 18th. And then, Colleen, quickly, you know, how much of an impact could, say, those provisional ballots have on some of the races? For example, you know, the Associated Press called all of the state's congressional elections, but just now, today, we're finding out that Republican David Richter um, has conceded to Andy Kim in the 3rd District. Republicans who used mail-in ballots did so later than Democrats, it seems. Um, and there is a question now of the provisionals coming in, whether they will favor um, Republicans, whether there are more Republicans there. Um, certainly in Republican towns, that's likely to be the case. Although anecdotally, it seems like there was not a huge um, turnout at the polls in many Republican places. Um, we do know that provis provisional ballots, um, there probably will be many from some of the cities like in Newark and Atlantic City, because we do know there were lines there. But again, we still don't know just how many there are. Colleen O'Day, thanks so much. Nope. Thank you, Bree. We're, we're still working on this. An important deadline for anyone who missed out on the extra federal unemployment benefits. Rhonda Schaffler has details and today's top business stories. Rhonda. Brianna, tomorrow's an important deadline for 100,000 unemployed residents who can receive an extra $300 a week in federal unemployment benefits. They have until Thursday at midnight to certify for those benefits under the FEMA Lost Wages Program, which provides a maximum payment of $1,800. Those who are eligible should receive an email and text message from the state. Emails will come from the address ui.noreply at bol.nj.gov. Check your spam messages if you don't see the email. Text messages will come from 898-211. The State Labor Department says if you don't receive a message, you are not eligible to certify for those benefits. Could New Jersey's record-setting sports betting market get even bigger? There's a bill in Trenton that would allow sports betting on all New Jersey collegiate games. Right now, state law bans betting on college games played anywhere in New Jersey and bans betting on games involving New Jersey teams that are played out of state. Dustin Galker, an analyst with PlayNJ, says if the law is changed, New Jersey would be in line with other states. States have taken a, a varied approach to this as far as how, how they treat college sports and whether they ban in-state in uh, teams and, and games, but most have allowed for this. Legislation calling for a public referendum on this issue next year has been approved by the Senate Budget Committee.
Another bill worth mentioning today aims to help military veterans find employment in civil service jobs. Veterans currently qualify for hiring preferences. This legislation broadens eligibility requirements and removes the requirement of specific lengths of service time. Bill sponsor Senator Kristen Corrado says the preference afforded to veterans is a well-deserved benefit for men and women who have served their country. Now to Wall Street, here's a look at the numbers. I'm Rhonda Schaffler, and those are your top business stories. Support for the Business Report provided by Junior Achievement of New Jersey, celebrating 100 years as a mission and announcing this year's virtual NJ Business Hall of Fame on November 19th at 6 p.m. Event details online at janj.org. The state is doubling down on efforts to make chemical companies pay for decades of contamination in our drinking water. The state attorney general and Department of Environmental Protection are suing three firms over allegedly releasing what are known as forever chemicals into waterways. These are used to make things like nonstick cookware or stain-proof clothing. And the chemicals, they don't break down once they're in the environment. They can be found in the Hudson River all the way down to Atlantic City. The lawsuits are seeking cleanup and remediation, monetary damages, an investigation on the chemicals released, and public disclosure of the findings. Part of the new COVID-19 restrictions announced earlier this week will hit school and club sports. Starting Thursday, there will be no more traveling out of state for indoor games and tournaments. It affects kids of all ages, all levels of play, and as Leah Mishkin reports, many are viewing it as a setback after waiting nearly a year on the sidelines. Walk, walk, walk. Press. Good. So I love gymnastics. I love flipping around. Olivia Kelly started gymnastics when she was two years old. She puts in at least four hours a day, six days a week, so she can reach the top level of the sport, elite. When you're elite, you go to like USAG and like kind of you can go to the Olympics and all that, like Simone Biles and you know all those big athletes. The ninth grader is only one step away. Last year, she couldn't compete at nationals, one of the top competitions in the country, because COVID cut the season short. This year, the 14-year-old had her sights set on gold again, hoping to compete at nationals in Washington. But with cases skyrocketing in New Jersey, Governor Murphy took traveling out of state off the table. Starting on Thursday, all interstate games and tournaments for indoor youth sports up to and including high school are prohibited for the time being. It simply is not safe for teams to be crossing state lines. They have worked 10 years, some of them 10 years, to try and make a national. The head coach at North Stars Gymnastics Academy also trained here as a kid. Ashley Miller went on to make the USA national team and got a full scholarship to a Division I school. All opportunities she fears her girls won't be able to get by keeping them in state. Level 10 nationals, there is a panel of 50 colleges that sit there. And you don't get that in any other competition. Miller says colleges start scouting as early as sixth grade and they start talking to athletes two years before graduation. Any other sport, if you're looking at football or basketball or things like that, once you get a scholarship, that's like the start of your semi-pro. In gymnastics, this is, this is what's hard, once you hit college, you're pretty much done. So to help our female athletes and our female girls have the same equality as men right now is to allow the gymnasts at the highest levels compete within a bubble. The CEO of New Jersey Business and Industry Association says the decision not only impacts athletes, but the economy. The whole idea of competition and travel teams is very much in vogue right now, and there's a lot of money in that industry. There are thousands of these businesses across the state. Your dance studios, your gymnastic schools, your karate schools, these small businesses that are literally hanging on by a thread right now, number one, number two. Um, the students who are participating, um, this is a really big deal. High school junior Amani Herring is in talks with several colleges, but competing in nationals this year would help her seal one of the few remaining scholarships. What are you trying to say to the kids? Well, once you reach the top, well, you're kind of screwed right now. We can't do anything about it. Or once your kid reaches the top, you say, we're going to fight for you. We're going to try and do everything we can because you've done everything you can. There was definitely a time where I did want to quit. If that's something you really love, you should really keep going with it because you're going to definitely regret it if you give up. Just keep pushing and you'll get it. 
a message Olivia Kelly hopes to give other girls if she reaches her dream of going to the Olympics and UCLA, encouraging words for her teammates today during these uncertain times. I'm Leah Mishkin for NJ Spotlight News. That does it for us tonight, but be sure to check out Chatbox with David Cruz live Thursday night at 6.30 p.m. That's on the NJ Spotlight News YouTube channel. He'll speak with the mayor of Jersey City on the impact of the new COVID-19 restrictions and Congresswoman Bonnie Watson Coleman about the impact black women had on the 2020 election. That's Thursday night at 6.30. And that's our broadcast. I'm Brianna Venozzi for the entire news team. Thanks for being with us. And to all those who served generations ago and those to come, thank you for your service. The members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. RWJ Barnabas Health, let's be healthy together. And Orsted, committed to the creation of a new long-term, sustainable, clean energy future for New Jersey. Day after day, we rely on electricity for all the ordinary things in our lives and for the extraordinary. Mom! Hey, sweetie. How are you? So, tell me about the game. I scored two goals. That's my boy. At PSEG, our commitment to you now is more powerful than ever. In uncertain times, you need someone who has your back. That's why at Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, we make sure our health plans have all the benefits you need. More ways to get care virtually. More support for your mental health, too. More tools on your phone. All in a range of health plans so you and your family can find just what you need. And we can help. Because everyone should feel like someone has their back. Not just in uncertain times. All the time.